this judgment by emphasizing that the petitioner did not demonstrate in any way how the alleged errors in unilateral corrections made by the first respondent affected the validity of the declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent on the 9th December 2020, as already stated in this judgment. The petitioner has not produced any evidence to rebut the presumption created by the publication of CI 135, for which his action has failed. We have therefore no reason to order a rerun as prayed by the petitioner as he relief F. We are only dismissed the petition as having no merit. No. candidate of the National Democratic Congress NDC in the 7th December 2020 presidential elections is seeking six reliefs against the Electoral Commission as first respondents and the presidential candidate of the New Patriotic Party NPP as the second respondent. The reliefs are in the nature of three declarations and three orders. Aside of relief ye, which is praying the court to restrain the second respondent from holding himself out as the president-elect of Ghana, all the other reliefs were directed against the first respondent. These reliefs are A. A declaration that Mrs. Jane Adukwe Mensa, chairperson of first respondent and the returning officer for the presidential election held on 7th December 2020, was in breach of Article 63 plus 3 of the 1992 Constitution. In the declaration she made on 9th December 2020, in respect of the presidential election that was held on 7th December 2020. B. A declaration that, based on the data contained in the declaration made by Mrs. Jane Adokwe Mensa, chairperson of first respondent and the returning officer for the presidential election held on 7th December 2020, no candidate satisfied the requirement of Article 63 Clause 3 of the 1982 Constitution to be declared President-elect. C. A declaration that the purported declaration made on 9th December 2020 of the results of the presidential election by Mrs. J. Adukwe Mensa, chairperson of first respondent, and the returning officer for the presidential election held on 7th December 2020 is unconstitutional, null and void, and of no effect whatsoever. D. An order annulling the declaration of President-elect instrument 2020 CI 135, dated 9th December 2020, issued under the hand of Mrs. Gina Duquemes, a chairperson of first respondent and the return of for the presidential election held on 7th December 2020 and gazetted on 10th December 2020. D. An order of injunction restraining the second respondent from holding himself out as president-elect. F. An order of mandatory injunction directing the first respondent to proceed to conduct a second election with petitioner and second respondent as the candidates as required under Article 63, Clause 4 and 5 of the 1992 Constitution. 
The language in which the first four reliefs, A to D, were crafted is suggestive that they were directed against the chairperson of the first respondent. However, the petition is not against her personally, but against the first respondent as an institution of state established under the 1982 constitution. The article and rule under which the petitioner mounted the action are Article 64.1 of the 1992 Constitution and Rule 68A of the Rules of the Supreme Court, CR 16 as amended by CR 74 and CR 99. They provide as follows, 64 plus 1. The validity of the election of the President may be challenged only by a citizen of Ghana who may present a petition for the purpose of the Supreme Court within 21 days after the declaration of the result of election, in respect of which the petition is presented. Rule 68A, despite Rule 45.4, the, the parties in the petition shall be A, the petitioner as specified in Article 64 plus 1 of the Constitution, and B, the person declared elected as president and the electoral commission, who together shall be the respondent. Though the petitioner is not in substance attacking the validity of the 7th December 2020 presidential elections, but only the declaration made on the 9th of December 2020, the petition is seen by many as a rehash of the presidential election petition of 2012-2013. In that petition, the second respondent herein, then as first petitioner and others, invoke Article 64 Clause 1 purportedly to invalidate the election of the petitioner herein, then as first respondent, as president-elect, as a novelty then in the constitutional history of the Fourth Republic, and such JSC prefaced his judgment in that petition in the following ways. Quote, the facts surrounding this suit have been fully played out in near epic dimensions before the public. However, there is no way this suit can be seen as a likeness of the numerous cases on various aspects of our 1992 constitution. Indeed, I venture to say it cannot be compared to any of the cases touching on various aspects of our constitution. By virtue of its peculiar nature and potential effects, many commentators have rightly described this suit as one posing a test of the structural maturity of our, democra sorry, our democratic ethos, causing all eyes worldwide to focus, even if only briefly, on our polity to see if and how we can surmount this unquiet challenge. Without doubt, the resolution of this case portends much for the future parts of our democratic development. See, end of quote, see a representational election petition, Akufuado and Baumia and Obi, Akufuado, Baumia and Obi Chebelamte, number four, versus Mahama, Electoral Commission and Central Democratic Congress, number four, 2013, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report Special Edition, page 73 at page 151. And Sanjay's description in the petition for the court in 2013 in the above words was apt. And that case remains one of the most important constitutional cases this APEX court determined in our current constitutional dispensation. It is therefore not strange that the attention that greeted the 2012 petition also gripped the instant one before us, thus placing the two seemingly similar cases on the same pedestal. The big question, however, is are the two cases alike or do they present similar issues for determination? The answer in both questions is a big no. It is therefore not surprising that the petitioner in this closing address filed on 23rd of February 2021 admitted the similarity in the Eastern petition and that of 2012-2013. Background to the petition. On the 7th December 2020, the first respondent hearing, the Rector Commission, which the constitutional body established under Article 43 of the Constitution 1992 to conduct all elections and referenda in Ghana, conducted parliamentary and presidential elections in all 275 constituencies in the country, which are made up of 38,622 polling stations. The election was conducted under Public Elections Regulations 2020 CI 127. At the close of the exercise, the first respondent, through its chairperson, declared the second president, the second respondent, Nana Adudakwekufuado, who was the presidential candidate of the new patriotic party, as the one validly elected as the president of the Republic of Ghana. 
This declaration was made on the 9th of December 2020, subject to Article 63, Clause 9 of the Constitution 1982 and Regulations 4410D and 11 of CI 127 2020, an instrument declaration of President elect instrument 2020. CI 135 was published under the hand of the chairperson of the first respondent to that effect and published in the Gazette on 10 December 2020. The instrument reads, quote, in exercise of the power conferred on the Electoral Commission under Article 63, Clause 9 of the 1992 Constitution, this instrument is hereby made. Nana Abdankwa Ekufuado, the new Patriotic Party MPP presidential candidate, having in the presidential election held on the 7th of December 2020, pursuant to Article 63, Clause 3 of the Constitution, obtained more than 50% of the total number of valid votes cast, is hereby declared the president elect of the Republic of Ghana. Given under my hand the 9th day of December 2020, signed Mrs. Jean Mensa. Chairperson of the Electoral Commission. End of quote. Article 63, Clause 9, on whose strength the instrument was made, provides quote, an instrument which A is executed under the hand of the Chairman of the Electoral Commission and under the seal of the Commission, and B states that the person named in the instrument was declared elected as the President of Ghana as a, at the election of the President shall be prima facie evidence that the person named was so elected, end of quote. The petitioner filed this petition to challenge the declaration made on the grounds of an alleged errors and lack of transparency on the part of the first respondent in the corruption of the said errors. The grounds for the petitioner's petition are that the said declaration violated Articles 23, 296A and B and 63.3 of the Constitution 1982 and therefore unconstitutional null and void and of no effect whatsoever. These articles of the Constitution mentioned in petitioner's petition are those allegedly violated for which the petitioner sought the relief under paragraphs 3A to F of his petition, which provides, quote, administrative bodies and administrative officials shall act fairly and reasonably and comply with the requirements imposed on them by law. A person agreed by the exercise of such acts and decisions shall have the right to seek redress before a court or other tribunal. 296A. Where in this constitution or in any other law, discretionary power is vested in any person or authority, that discretionary power shall be deemed to imply a duty to be fair and candid. B. The exercise of the discretionary power shall not be arbitrary, capricious, or biased either by resentment, prejudice, or personal dislike and shall be in accordance with due process of law. 63.3. A person shall not be elected as president of Ghana unless at the presidential election the number of votes cast in his favor is more than 50% of the total number of valid votes cast at the election. End of quote. The petition itself. The petitioner, per his reliefs and grounds, is not challenging the data presented by the first respondent from which the second respondent's declaration as president elect was made. As a result of that, he has not presented to the court any figures to contradict the data of the first respondent. Petitioner's case simply is that the figures or data declared by the chairperson of the first respondent as a valid vote cast and those obtained by the two contestants, that is petitioner and second respondent, when computed, do not give the second respondent more than 50% of the said votes to merit a declaration as provided under Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. The petitioner averred that the declaration was therefore unconstitutional, null and void. The petitioner proceeded further to seek an order to set aside the instrument affirming the declaration, that CI 135, and a further order to organize a fresh rerun between the petitioner and the second respondent in compliance with Article 63, Clause 4 and 5 of the Constitution 1992. The above constitutional instrument, the, sorry, the above constitutional provisions were reproduced under Regulation 14, 1, 2, and 3, for, Regulation 44, 1, 2, and 3 of CI 127, and they read, 63, 4, where at the presidential election, there are more 
than two candidates, and no candidate obtains the number of percentage of votes specified in clause three of this article, a second election shall be held within 21 days after the previous election. Five, the candidates for a presidential election held under clause four of this article shall be the two candidates who obtain the two highest numbers of votes at the previous election. End of quote. From the nature of the relief sought in this petition, relief B appears to be the major relief on which the other five reliefs, that is A, C, D, E, and F, are buttressed. The success or failure of reliefs A, C, D, E, and F depend on the success or failure of relief B. For purposes of emphasis, we wish to reproduce petitioners relief B. It reads, a declaration that based on the data contained in the declaration made by Mrs. Jean Adukwe Mensa, chairperson of first respondent and the returning officer for the presidential election held on 7 December 2020, no candidate satisfied the requirement of Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1982 Constitution to be declared president-elect. This relief B, as quoted above, raises an arithmetical question. It cannot be resolved without resorting to some calculations. The first task is to know the data the first respondent presented, which the petitioner was referring to. The data will contain inter alia, the total number of votes cast at the election, the total number of valid votes cast, the total number of valid votes cast in favor of the second respondent, and the total number of valid votes cast in favor of the petitioner. A percentage of each of the candidates is then calculated against the total value votes cast. This is the only way to determine whether or not the second respondent obtained more than 50% of the valid votes cast or not, as the petitioner has challenged. In effect, if the petitioner is able to satisfy this court that the data contained in the declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent did not give the second respondent more than 50% of the total valid votes cast, in the presidential elections on 7 December 2020, then all the other relief sought under A, C, D, E, and F must be granted as a matter of course. As that would mean Article 63 Clause 3 has been violated, thus rendering the said declaration unconstitutional, null, and void. The petitioner, in advancing reason to support his petition, contended that the first respondent effected corrections to its original data as announced on 9th December 2020. The said corrections were null and void, as they do not reflect on the declaration made on 9th December 2020. Again, the first respondent did not indicate when the said corrections were made, and also did not involve the petitioner and his agents when making the corrections. The petitioner attached to his petition a pen drive of the video clip of the declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent, a copy of CI 135, a copy of a press release issued by the first respondent on 10 December 2020, announcing the errors in the declaration and the corrections made, and a few other documents like summary and spreadsheets. According to the petitioner, the first respondent was not fair to him when he failed to engage his agents and to involve them in the corrections of the errors before the declaration. There was therefore no transparency in the corrections made, making the declaration and CI 135 unconstitutional, null and void, as same constituted a violation of Articles 23, 296A and B and 63.3 of the 1992 Constitution. It is for this reason that the petitioner sought under Relief D an order annulling CI 135 and a further order directing the first respondent to proceed to conduct a second election between the first two candidates, that is, second respondent and petitioner, as the only candidates as required under Article 63, Clauses 4 and 5 of the 1992 Constitution. Clearly, from the nature of the relief sought in the INSA petition, it is not identical with the 2012 presidential election petition. That petition sought to invalidate the presidential election conducted by the Electoral Commission by the annulment of over 4 million votes due to alleged irregularities such as overvoting, lack of signature of presiding officers on some pinches, no biometric verification in some of the constituencies.
However, in this one, the petitioner is not seeking any such relief. He has not asked for the annulment of any votes cast anywhere during the election. And he has not said that the election was badly conducted. He is only seeking to annul CI 135 and a rerun between the candidates with the two highest number of votes. Because the computation of the data presented by the first respondent does not give the second respondent more than 50% of the total value votes cast. That is what PW1, the General Secretary of the NDC, Mr. Johnson, testifying under oath, told the court that they did not come to court to challenge figures, so they brought no figures of their own to the court. According to him, they were judging the chairperson of the first respondent by her own Bible, by which he meant they were judging her by her own data from which the second respondent was declared president-elect. The first respondent case in answer. The first respondent denied petitioner's claim that from his data as presented in the declaration, the second respondent did not obtain more than 50% of the valuable cast in presidential elections held on 7 December 2020. The first respondent admitted the petitioner's contention that it initially made mistakes in the figures announced on the 9th of December 2020 in the declaration by just opposing the total number of votes cast in the presidential elections with that of the total number of valid votes cast. However, this error was immediately corrected and the correct figure mentioned in a press release the following day, 10th December 2020, and accordingly published in the official gazette. First respondent contended further that even with the error, the fact that the second respondent obtained more than 50% of the total valid votes cast was not in doubt. The first respondent prayed the court to dismiss petitioner's petition for disclosing no cause of action. The second respondent case in answer. The second respondent also denied petitioner's case and describes him as incompetent and void of any substance whatsoever. He was of the view that even though petitioners said no candidate obtained more than 50 percent of the total valid votes cast and sought a rerun between the two of them, the petitioner did not indicate the number of valid votes or percentage thereof that she should have obtained in the election, or the number of valid votes or percentage thereof that the second respondent should have obtained in the election to support the allegations and requests for a rerun. He contended further that the corrections of the errors by the first respondent in her statement on the 9th of December 2020, and next by the petitioner to a statement in support of the petition, were made within the authority of the first respondent and do not infringe any law. According to second respondent, the correction effected by the first respondent in his press release of 10 December 2020 provided the proper reckoning of the percentage of votes obtained by the second respondent using the valid votes cast rather than total votes cast and showed that the second respondent obtained more than 50% of the valid votes cast as required under Article 63.3 of the Constitution. He averred that petitioners claim are anchored on an innocuous mistake made by the first respondent in interchanging total votes cast for valid votes cast when announcing the various percentages obtained by each candidate on 9 December 2020. Second respondent contended strongly that when the total valid votes cast are used as the yardstick he would still be outright winner of the election by more than 50% of the votes, even if by statistical projection the votes of all the 128 and 8, 128,018 registered voters in the Chiman South were to be added to petitioner's vote. The second respondent averred further that if the total number of votes obtained by each candidate in the Chiman South is factored into the results, declared by the first respondent on 9 December 2020. The second respondent's share of the valid votes cast is still well over 51%. In fact, the petitioner has no question in the petition. Second respondent denied allegations of violation of Articles 23 and 296 of the Constitution as misconceived. In the alleged vote pardon and the errors on the alleged vote Pardon, and the errors and errors referred to by the petitioner, the second respondent, who denied same, contended that granted the allegations were true, they did not have any effect whatsoever on the result of the election. He said the alleged 
unconstitutionality of the declaration or gazette notification of an election does not constitute a challenge to the validity of an election of a person as president. He emphatically concluded that the petitioner has neither challenged the conduct of the election itself nor its validity, so his action is not an election petition properly so called and ought to be dismissed in limine. Second respondent served notice of his intention to raise a preliminary objection to the petition on the ground inter alia that the petition did not meet the requirement imposed on the petitioner under Article 64, Clause 1 of the Constitution 1992. He subsequently filed a preliminary objection, as the first respondent also did, for the dismissal of the petition on the ground that it discloses no reasonable cause of action in terms of Article 64, Clause 1 of the Constitution 1992. Though both the first and second respondents prayed the court to set down for legal argument the objections eliminate to petitioner's objection, the court decided to hear the petition in detail and resolve the preliminary legal objection together with other issues raised by the pleadings of the parties. Issues set down by the courts for determination. The court directed each of the parties to file a memorandum of issues for trial. The parties complied and filed issues they considered material for consideration. Out of those issues and the materials contained in the petition and the answers to the petition, this court adopted the following as the real issues arising from the pleading for determination. One, whether or not the petition discloses any reasonable cause of action. Two, whether or not based on the data contained in the declaration of the first respondent or the second respondent as president-elect, no candidate obtained more than 50% of the valid vote cast as required by Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. 3. Whether or not the second respondent still met the Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution threshold by the exclusion or inclusion of the 13 South constituency presidential election results. 4. Whether or not the declaration by the first respondent dated 9 December 2020 of the results of the presidential election conducted on the 7th December 2020 was in violation of Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. And five, whether or not the alleged vote pardon and other errors complained of by the petitioner affected the outcome of the presidential election results of 2020. Mode of trial. Since the rules of this court regulating presidential election petition trials, that is CI 16 as amended by CR 74 and CR 99 has a regimented timetable that include a scheduled date for pre-trial case management protocols. The court adopted the procedure in the High Court civil procedure rules as amended by CR 87, the filing of witness statements would exhibit if any. The court accordingly directed the parties to comply by filing witness statements within specified periods. They were also directed to file their written submission for and against the preliminary objection raised to the petition by the respondent. Though the petitioner defaulted initially in the direction to file witness statements and their answer to the legal submissions made by the respondents on the preliminary objection, they later complied and when the court admonished them to do so within 24 hours or have their petition determined in accordance with the law. The petitioner, who did not file any witness statement of his own, Five witness statements of two witnesses he intended to lie on to establish his case. The first respondent also filed a witness statement of his chairperson, while the second respondent filed a witness statement through his attorney. Standard of proof, burden of proof, and persuasion. A petition of this nature is a form of civil litigation, and like all civil cases, the standard of proof is one on the balance of probabilities or preponderance of the probabilities. The proof prescribed in civil trials is provided under sections 10, 11, and 12 of the Evidence Act 1965, MRCD 323. These sections on the burden of proof, burden of persuasion, and burden of producing evidence, which apply equally to election petitions, provide us 10 what? For the purpose of this act, the burden of persuasion means the obligation of a party to establish a requisite degree of belief concerning a fact in the mind of the tribunal of facts or the courts. The burden of persuasion may require a party A to raise a reasonable doubt concerning the existence or non-existence of a fact, or B to establish the existence or non-existence of a fact by a preponderance of the probabilities or by proof beyond a reasonable doubt. 
1101, for purpose of this act, the burden of producing evidence means the obligation of a party to introduce sufficient evidence to avoid the ruling on the issue against that party. 12.1, except as otherwise provided by law, the burden of persuasion requires proof by a preponderance of probabilities. 12.2, preponderance of probabilities means that the that degree of certainty or belief in the mind of the tribunal of fact or the court by which it is convinced that the existence of a fact is more probable than its non-existence. End of quote. As was held by this court, per edition at Edinia JEC in Accra versus Pega Transport Limited, 2010 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, page 728 at 736. It is a basic principle of law on evidence that a party who bears the burden of proof is to produce the required evidence of the facts in issue that has the quality of credibility, short of which is claim may fail. End of quote. See also the case of IE versus Share Ghana Limited and Fraga or Limited, 2017-2020, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report 721-733, where this court speaking to Ubin in JSE had this to say, quote, it must be pointed out that in every civil trial, all what the law required is proof by preponderance of probabilities. See section 12 of the Evidence Act 1975 and RCD 323. The amount of evidence required to sustain the standard of proof would depend on the nature of the issue to be resolved. The law does not require that the court cannot rely on the evidence of a single witness in proof of the point in issue. The credibility of the witness and its knowledge of the subject matter are determinant factors. See AMA versus Hydrafoam Estates Ghana Limited 2013-2014 to Supreme Court of Ghana Report 1551. Indeed, even the failure by a party himself to give evidence cannot be used against him by the court in assessing his case. This court's decision in Ray Ashali Boche Lance, Ajete Abusu v. Kote, 2003-2004, Supreme Court of Ghana Report 420, per George Nehu, JSC, as it then was at page. 448 and Ama vs. Hydra from Estate Ghana Limited referred to Supra. In the last case cited, the plaintiff did not testify in the action at all and only relied on the testimony of the court appointed witness. Yet he succeeded and this court considered the process valid so long as the evidence relied upon was credible and efficient, sufficient to discharge evidential burden he assumed. Cases on election petitions in Africa and other common law jurisdictions give credence to the notion that in such cases where a petitioner seeks to annul an election or a declaration pertaining to an election, he bears the legal burden of proof throughout. See Abu Bakr versus Yaldua, 2009, all FWLR Part 4571 Supreme Court. Odinga v. Uhuru Kenyatta, 2012, petition number 5. Office v. Renewski, 2012, SCC 55. Biseji v. Museveni, Yawari, Kaguta, and the Lord Commission of Uganda, 2012, UGSC. Okay. 2001, Uganda. Uganda Supreme Court. In the Ugandan case of Biseji v. Museveni and the Lord Commission of Uganda, Supra, the Uganda Supreme Court held, quote, the burden of proof in election petitions, as in other civil cases, is settled. It lies on the petitioner to prove his case to the satisfaction of the court. And in the Yaradua case, the Supreme Court of Nigeria held that the burden is on the petitioner to prove not only non-compliance with the electoral law, but also that the non-compliance affected the results of the election. End of quote. The court, this court adopted the same principle in the first presidential election petition titled Ekufuado. Baumia and Obechebe Lamte versus Mahama and Adetra Commission, number 4, 2013, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, Special Edition, page 673. The trial itself, evidence led by petitioner. The petitioner did not testify himself and appointed no attorney to testify on his behalf, but called three witnesses in all. They were Mr. Johnson, S.C. Nketia, PW1, Dr. Pesa White, PW2, and Mr. Robert Joseph Metal Nunu, PW3. Under the law, the petitioner is not bound to testify himself if only he could prove his case through other witnesses or by any other means. See the case of Ria Shalbuchi, Lance, Ajete Abusu, and others, Escote, and other Supra. We know of no law 
in the common law jurisdiction, especially in civil trials, that mandates a court to compel a party to testify against his will. The failure of the petitioner to testify himself is therefore not fatal to his cause, as the law permits that. What is required from him by law is for him to call requisite witness or witnesses or put before the court sufficient material as evidence. Initially, the petitioner indicated calling two witnesses, so only two witness statements were filed on the orders of the court. These witnesses were PW1 and 2. After the two witnesses had completed their testimonies through the adoption of their witness statements and court examination, the petitioner prayed the court to permit him to call a third and final witness to conclude his case. Though the prayer came at a time the petitioner had not given any prior indication of such an intention, for which counsel for the respondents raised objection to the move, the court obliged him and made an order for a witness statement to be taken from his witness to enable him to testify for the petitioner. The petitioner did so and closed his case with the witness who testified as PW3. Out of these three witnesses, the one whose testimony appeared to have some relevance in the issues at stake was Mr. Johnson, the Sedun Ketia PW1. He was, in fact, the star witness of the petitioner. His testimony vividly explained the reasons why the petitioner is in court. As for the other two witnesses, that is PW2 and 3, Dr. Kwesa White and Mr. Robert Joseph Metinuno, the little said about their testimonies relative to the issue at stake, the better. PW2 and PW3 were agents who represented petitioner. The petitioner in the National Coalition Center dubbed the strong room. Their testimonies were based mainly on what allegedly happened in the strong room during the final coalition and the fact that they failed to sign the final form of the presidential election scored from 13 because of disagreements they had, they, sorry, they said they had with the chairperson of first respondent and her staff in the strong room. They recounted a fanciful tale of how the chairperson refused to heed the complaints on some irregularities they noticed in some of the coalition forms that came from some of the regions. We described this evidence as fanciful because despite this alleged protest, they went ahead to verify and certify 13 out of the 16 election regional coalition chiefs. Their testimony included an account of how the chairperson of the first respondent managed to trick, uh, sorry, to trick them to lead a strong room by sending them on an errand to compare with the petitioner. During which period, he declared the result of the presidential election without their participation. While the testimony of Peter Bruma was emphatic that the petitioner is not in court to challenge or compare the figures or data presented by the first respondent with any other figures, the testimonies of PW2 and PW3 were in respect of alleged irregularities in the figures or data, or, or data on some of the original coalition forms that they cited in the strong room, but which they ultimately signed or certified. Notwithstanding all these allegations of misunderstandings with staff from the first respondent in the strong room and the fact that they were absent during the declaration, they did not give any indication as to how these happenings and the absence affected the final results announced by the first respondent. Having signed or certified these forms, the witnesses, particularly DW3, cannot turn around to talk of irregularities in the same forms. Their testimonies would have carried some little weight if the purpose of the petition was to challenge entries made on the coalition forms or submissions, but that is not the case. Their testimonies were therefore of no relevance or server to the issues set down for determination, and we found them unworthy for any consideration whatsoever in the settlement of the issues. In fact, regarding the testimonies of PW2 and PW3, if their evidence is to be believed, then they have to blame themselves for abandoning their post at the National Coalition Center at the time the verification and certification of the results were ongoing, and PW3 had then verified and certified 13 regional coalition results out of the 16. The agents of the petitioner were given the opportunity to be in the strong room. In addition, the petitioner had two additional agents as backup or standby. PW2 and PW3 were not under any obligation to leave the strong room under any circumstances. Besides, other presidential candidates had their agents or representatives in the strong room and eight of them signed 
from 13. If the petitioners again believe that in the absence something untoward happened, the petitioner should have called any of the other agents in the strong room to testify in court any infractions that happened in the absence, if any. The law is that when corroborative evidence exists, the law is that where corroborative evidence exists, the law expects a party to call such evidence in proof of his case and not mount the witness box and repeat his amendments on notes. The Ditum in Mojalagwe versus Labi, 1959, Ghana Report 190, Per Ole Muji Ashi, there was a straight good law. The petitioner's agents were given the opportunity to represent petitioner in the strong room and they decided to leave. They cannot complain now that the declaration was done in their absence. With respect to the duties of party agents or representatives, we refer and we refer to the Kenyan case of Raya Amolo Odinga and another versus independent electoral and land risk commission and four others, number two, of 20th September 2017, where in Indongu in SCG opined that while the constitution gives citizens the right to vote, the freedom to choose and conditions are created for the realization of that right. It is not the business of the court to aid the indolent. If party agents are required to be present, sign statutory form and, and, and undertake any other legitimate duty that is imposed on, on them as part of the political process in an election, then they are under obligation to do it. To fail to do so is not only to fail one's party, but also to fail our democracy. The courts must fall upon any such inaction, reluctance, and delay. A candidate or her agent cannot abscond duty from a polling station and then ask the court to overturn the election because of a failure to sign a statutory form. Every party in an election needs to pull their own weight to ensure that the ideals in Article 86 are achieved that we shall once and for all have simple, accurate, and verifiable, secure, accountable, transparent elections. Again, in the Nigeria case of Atiku Abubakar, the Independent National Electoral Commission, Buhari, Supra, Mohamed Lawa Agaba, JC, stated us, it is pertinent to restate that from the evidence of all the witnesses called by the appellant, they admitted that their police then signed all the results sheets and this so voluntarily on the instruction of their party, the first respondent. The implication is therefore obvious, as it would have authenticated the validity of the documents. In other words, the results is the agents in law were all presumed to understand what they appended their signatures there to. They could not in the circumstances have turned around, around to deny the contents of their signatures. End of quote. Evidence of Peter Moore. Regard to the first witness, Peter Moore, the government of his evidence as per his witness statement after the court has had expunged some portions of sin upon objection raised by the respondent is captured in the answers he gave during examination by counsel for the first and second respondents. According to him, the petitioner did not come to court to challenge the validity of the figures or data presented by the chairperson of the first respondent. That is why in his testimony he did not provide any data to contradict that of the first respondent. His assertion was that the figures initially collated by the chairperson contained errors which his party, the National NDC, the National Democratic Congress, pointed out in a letter addressed to the chairperson on the 9th of December 2020 before the declaration. However, in effecting corrections to the wrong figures or data, the first respondent did not invite them for their participation, but unilaterally effected the said corrections contrary to articles 23 and 296 A and B of the 1982 Constitution. The question is, what is the legal implication, if any, of first respondent failure to involve the petitioner and his agents in correcting administrative or clerical errors made in the computation of the declaration. Neither the petitioner nor his witnesses mentioned any to us, and we do not find any. The court has held in several cases, including the recent ones of Grigori Afoko versus Attorney General, which number J1 slash 8 slash 2019, dated 19 June 2019, unreported, and Mayor Ablese, 
and two other is attorney general suit number J1 slash 28 slash 2018, dated 28 November 2018, all reported. The breaches or violations of Article 23 on administrative justice and the exercise discretion under Article 26, the exercise of discretion under Article 20, 296 of the 1992 Constitution by administrative bodies which includes the first respondent are no matters for the Supreme Court. These are infractions that the petitioner would have sought redress in the High Court. To quote Marfusam J.S. in the Foucault case Supra, Article 23 of the Constitution deals with administrative actions and even where a breach of that provision is alleged, the remedy lies in the High Court and not this court. Article 23 is part of Chapter 5 of the 1992 Constitution of Fundamental Human Rights and Freedoms, which by Article 33, 1 and 2 of the Constitution ought to be enforced in the High Court. End of quote. See also a due versus Attorney General, 1996-97 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, page 1. And a due versus Attorney General number 2, 1997-98 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, 753. On the exercise of discretion under Article 296 and alleged breaches, or violations of sin. This court in the Mayor Agblese case, Super Head Per Court JSC as follows. Throughout the Constitution, discretion has been vested in persons or bodies charged with responsibility to exercise one power or the other. When the discretionary power is not exercised according to law, the recourse by an aggrieved party lies in some other remedy provided for in the Constitution and not an invitation to invoke the original jurisdiction of this court, end of quote. Though the two authorities cited above involved the invocation of the original jurisdiction of this court under Articles 2, 1B, and 131 of the 1992 question, the same applies to an election petition. The first respondent is an independent body that performs its functions without any, anybody's directions or assistance. Article 46 is specific about this. It reads, except as provided in this constitution or any other law not inconsistent with this constitution in the performance of its functions the electoral commission shall not be subject to the direction or control of any person or authority end of quote there is no dispute that the first respondent complied with article 296 clause c when it published the regulations ci 127 by this publication the first respondent did not breach clause b of article 296 as its actions were not capricious and arbitrary. They were regulated by CI 127, and there is no complaint anywhere by the petitioner that the first respondent did not comply with CI 127. If it is the case of anybody that the first respondent violated Article 23 and 296 in the discharge of his duties, which included the declaration of the presidential results under Article 63 clause of the 1992 Constitution, the remedy of that person lies in the High Court because strictly such a complaint cannot be an election petition challenging the validity of the election of the President of Ghana. The respondent case. At the close of the petitioner's case, the respondent decided or elected not to testify at the proceedings. They relied on Order 38. Rule 3E5 of the High Court Civil Procedure Rule CR 47 as amended by CR 87, which the court adopted to regulate the trial in addition to the rules provided under CI 16 as amended by CI 74 and CI 99. The respondent prayed the court to decide the issues before it on the strength of the oral and documentary evidence led by the petitioner through his witnesses. This decision by the respondent, which is not innovative but accepted as settled practice, attracted strong opposition from counsel for the petitioner who stated that the chairperson of the first, first respondent must be made to testify for her to be co-examined. All the attempts employed by counsel for the petitioner which included an attempt to reopen petitioner's case for him to subpoena the first chairperson of the first respondent to testify for him as a witness and an application to review the court's ruling on respondent decision not to call evidence, which were all cited by counsel for the respondents, were dismissed by the courts. He would like to retweet the point made above that in law, the step taken by the respondents has the sanction of time on it and settled practice in our adversarial system of justice. The position of law 
of the law is that after the close of the plaintiff or a petitioner's case, a defendant or a respondent for that matter has three options open to him. The defendant or respondent may elect to open his defense and call witnesses if he so wishes. Secondly, the defendant or respondent may elect to rest his case on the plaintiffs or petitioners when he is of the view that the case of the plaintiff or petitioner is weak and has failed to raise a prima facie case to warrant the defense to us. Lastly, the defendant or respondent may elect to make a no case submission, whereupon he may be put on election by a trial judge. There is no case submission. There is no, the, this no case submission, sorry, is to the effect that even if the whole of the evidence led by the plaintiff is admitted, there is no prima facie case made out by the plaintiff or petitioner. Mohamed Lawa Gaba, JC of the Court of Appeal of Nigeria in the presidential election petition between Atiku Ubaka and another the Independent National Electoral Commission, Heineck and two others, petition number C slash PEPC slash 002 slash 2019, dated 11 September 2019, stated, quote, the third position of the law is that a defendant to an action or a respondent in an election petition is entitled to rest his case on that of the claimant or the petitioner where he has, through devastating cross-examination, elicited or contract or extracted sufficient evidence to support and prove the facts or assertions contained in his pleadings. In such circumstances, a defendant or respondent can decide not to call any witness. It does not amount to not calling evidence or failure to call evidence. End of quote. The Nigerian Court of Appeal, in coming to this above conclusion, relied on the dictum of justice in the case of Pastor Eze, Ian, Andrew, and another, the Sainek, 2018-9-MWR, part 1C25-507 at 5A2-TM, where the Supreme Court held, quote, evidence enlisted from a party or his witness under co-examination, which goes to support the case of the party, co-examine, to constitute evidence in support of the case or defense of the party. If at the end of the day, the party co-examine decides not to call any witness, he can rely on the evidence elicited from co-examination in establishing his case or defense. One may, however, say that the party called no witness in support of his case, not evidence as the evidence elicited from his opponent under co-examination, which is in support of his case or defense constitutes his evidence in the case. The exception is that the evidence so elicited under cross-examination must be on the facts pleaded by the party concerned for it to be relevant to the determination of the question or issue in controversy between the parties, having regard to the fact that the relevant evidence elicited from the appellants relate to the facts pleaded by way of defense to the action. They form part of the respondent case and can be relied upon by the respondent in establishing their defense to the action without calling witnesses to further establish the said defense. End of it. This court, therefore, after the respondent have decided not to call witnesses, directed the parties in the petition to file their closing addresses or submissions for consideration of the court in resolving the issues set down for trial. Submission by petitioner and the respondent. The respondent filed their witness submissions as directed by this court on 17th February 2021. Petitioner, on the other hand, did not comply with the directives of the court to file his question address or submission by the close of 17th February 2021. He, however, later sought leave of the court to file it out of time, which the court granted. He therefore filed his submission or closing address on the 23rd of February 2021. We shall refer to the relevant portions of the submissions or closing address when necessary in addressing the issue set down for determination, evaluation of the evidence on record, and the decision of the court. This court set down five issues for the de determination. They were, one, whether or not the petition discloses any reasonable course of action, whether or not based on the data contained in the declaration of the first respondent of the second respondent as president elect, no candidate obtained more than 50 percent of the valid vote cast as required by Article 63 or 3 of the 1992 Constitution. Three, whether or not the second respondent still met the Article 63 or 3 of the 1992 Constitution threshold by exclusion or inclusion of the Techi Mansa constituency presidential election results. Four, whether or not the declaration by the first respondent dated 9 December 2020 
of the results of the presidential elections conducted on the 7th December 2020 was in violation of Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution. Whether or not the alleged vote pardon and other errors complained of by the petitioner affected the outcome of the presidential election results of 2020, we shall now address the issue settled for the intervention in this petition issue reasonable course of action. The first issue is whether or not the petition discloses a reasonable course of action. Though this issue was raised by the respondent as a preliminary point, the court decided to deal with it alongside the determination of the substantive issues settled for the trial. The court accordingly ordered the parties to file their respective submissions on this issue. The case of the respondent on this issue is that examining the petition and considering the reliefs thereof, no reasonable course of action has been raised to properly invoke the jurisdiction of the court under Article 64 of the 1992 Constitution, and for that matter, the petition should be dismissed summarily. According to the respondent, the petition does not challenge the voting process and the counting of ballots, neither does the petition challenge the coalition of votes from the police stations through to the National Coalition Center and the declaration of the results of the presidential election. The respondents argued further that the trust of the petitioner's complaints relates to the errors contained in the declaration of the winner of the presidential election by the chairperson of the first respondent on the 9th December 2020 and the subsequent correction of the errors. The respondent posited that the facts alleged in the petition the reliefs thereof do not meet the threshold of challenging the validity of the presidential election as envisaged under Article 64, Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution. The petitioner opposed the preliminary objection and argued that the petition discloses a cause of action against the respondent. The petitioner argued, for example, that the petition alleges that the figures used by the chairperson for the first respondent to declare the results was in breach of the Constitution that the figures supplied by the first respondent did not at all reflect the actual results of the elections, that the first respondent officials padded votes in favor of the second respondent and also alleged wrong aggregation, aggregation of votes. The petitioner therefore submitted that the objection be dismissed. It is right that a party such as the petitioner who initiates an action in court against another person must have an accrued cause of action. The cause of action is the existence of facts who give rise to an enforceable claim or a factual situation, the existence of which entitles one to obtain from the court a remedy against another. Generally, before a party issues a risk, a risk he must have a right recognized in law, which right has been violated by the defendant in ascertaining whether the petition whether the petition, the subject of this action, discloses example cause of action, it is important that the court critically examine the petitions who filed, in particular, the grounds, the release and doors therein, and the answers filed by the respondents. For the court to satisfy itself that on the face of the petition, tribal issues have been raised. These issues could be issues of fact, law, or both law and fact. We think that once the court is satisfied that the issues raised in an originating process, such as a petition or a writ, is not frivolous, then the cause of action has been disclosed to invoke the jurisdiction of the court. In the case of the Sebra Asariba II and four others versus Attorney General, 2010 Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report 463, this court, speaking through Judge Nawuti, stated that to identify the real substance of actions brought before the court, we have observed that the proper approach is to examine the rates as well as the pleadings in this type of litigation, the reliefs and the facts verified by the affidavit. End of it. Further, it is always the duty of the court not to assume jurisdiction over a suit where the court has no jurisdiction over either the subject matter of the suit, the parties to the action, or where a party to the suit is not close with capacity regarding the subject matter in issue. Again, a court may not assume jurisdiction over a case where issues of limitation, estoppel, per rem judicata are raised and proof as preliminary points. In the circumstances of any of the above being applicable, the court ought not to assume jurisdiction to determine the merits of the case before it. In the absence of the existence of any of these factors, the court decided to incorporate its ruling on this issue in its final judgment. In this petition, the petitioner was one of the candidates who contested the presidential election held on 7th of December 2020 
and thus had the right to challenge the validity of the results declared by the chairperson or the first respondent if he is so aggrieved. The petitioner by this petition is challenging the act of the chairperson or the first respondent, declaring the second respondent the winner of the elections on grounds that the second respondent did not cross the constitutional threshold of more than 50% votes. The petitioner has also alleged wrong aggregation of votes and vote pardon by officers of the first respondent in favor of the second respondent. We are of the opinion that these allegations relate to the integrity of the election and, if proved, may impact the, val the validity of the election. The allegations thus provide enough grounds for the invocation of the jurisdiction of this court under Article 64 of the 1992 Constitution and thus confer on the petitioner a course of action to initiate the action. The second respondent at paragraph 23 of his written submissions in support of the preliminary objection did concede that the allegation of wrong aggregation of votes and vote pardon could be described as irregularities in an action, but the number in an election, but the number of votes involved in the allegations cannot materially affect the outcome of the election. On this concession, as well as our own thinking, we are convinced that the petition discusses a reasonable course of action. We wish to state that a court called upon to decide whether or not a party has a course of action must not dwell so much on the strength of that party's case, since that can only be determined if the matter is submitted to trial. For example, in this petition, the court must assume jurisdiction in order to determine whether the averments regarding the declaration of results and the issue of CI 135 are sustainable in law, whether there was vote pardon, and if so, whether it had any impact on the results declared by the chairperson of the first respondent. On this issue, therefore, the argument that the petitioner must have a weak case may have... Sorry. On this issue, therefore, the argument that the petitioner may have a weak case is no good ground to summarily dismiss the petition as contended by the respondent. See appear, this is Kevin Boaji, 1993 one Report 417, where this court held that whenever the pleadings in the case raise some questions fit to be decided by evidence, the mere fact that the party's case or defense might be weak would be no ground for striking it out. On this point, we agree with the decision in the off-quoted case of Dyson v. Attorney General, 1911-1KB410, cited by counsel for the petitioner on terminating proceedings without preliminary trial. In that case, Morton L.J. said at page 419 that, quote, the court will not permit a plaintiff to be driven from the judgment seat without considering his right to be heard except in cases where the course of action is obviously and almost incontestably bad, end of quote. Having carefully considered the pleadings, especially the constitutional provisions referred to and the issues raised by the parties, it is our view that this petition is not incontestably bad in law or frivolous and vexatious, such that it ought to be summarily dismissed. Any alleged breach of the fundamental law of the land must be carefully examined by this court as the only court clothed with jurisdiction to do so. It is on the basis of these reasons that we hope that the preliminary objection raised by the respondent hearing should be overruled for the petition to be determined on the merits. Validity of the declaration of the results of the presentation is that, that is issue two. We now address issue two which is whether or not based on the data obtained in the declaration by the first whether sorry we will now address issue two which is whether or not based on the data contained in the declaration by the first respondent of the second respondent as president elect no candidate obtained more than 50 percent of the valid vote cast as required by article 63 cross 3 of the 1992 constitution the source of this issue could be traced to the errors in the declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent on the 9th December 2020. In that declaration, which was tendered as Exhibit A by PW1, Mr. Isidun Ketia, the chairperson of the first respondent, was seen and heard, given the particulars of the total votes of each of the 12 candidates obtained at the end of the post, excluding the votes from Techim and South constituency, which was still outstanding. 
There is no doubt that in providing particulars of the votes cast, the chairperson of the first respondent announced the figure 13 million four hundred and thirty four thousand five hundred and seventy four when he was referring to total valid votes cast, which was in actuality thirteen million one hundred and twenty one thousand one hundred and eleven. As a result of this erroneous reference, the petitioner pleaded at paragraph six, seven, eight, nine and ten of the petition, which are reproduced as follows. Quote six purporting to declare the results Ms. Mrs. Jane Adukwe Mensa, chairperson of first report and the returning officer to the presidential election said, at the end of the transparent, fair, orderly, timely and peaceful presidential elections, the total number of valid votes cast was 13,434,574, representing 79% of the total registered voters. Seven. In the declaration, Mrs. Jean Adukwe Mensa, chairperson of first respondent and the returning officer for the presidential election, further said that second respondent of the NDP obtained 6,730,413 votes, being 51.595% 51 of the total valid votes cast. Eight, the claim that the percentage of the total votes cast was 51.595% of the total valid votes that she herself distinctly stated to have been 13,434,574 was manifest error and votes cast for second, as votes cast for second respondent would amount to 50% and not the 51.59% 95% erroneously declared. Nine, Mrs. Jean Edukwe Mesa, chairperson of first respondent and the returning officer for the presidential election, further declared that, quote, Don Dramani Mahama of NDC obtained 6,214,899 votes, being 47.366% of the total valid votes cast. Ten, from the total valid votes cast of 13,434,574, the Petitioner's percentage will be 46,260, 46.260% and not 46.260% and not the 47.366% erroneously declared. End of quote. From the evidence on record, it seems. The petitioner built his case around a figure of 13,434,574 erroneously announced by the chairperson of first respondent as the total valid votes cast. The description she gave to this figure was wrong. As with A, which is a video clip of the declaration, gave details of all the votes obtained by all the presidential candidates, and this gave a total valid vote cast of 13,121,111. Out of this figure, the second respondent, Nana Akufuado, of the NPP, obtained 6,630,730,413, while the petitioner, John Dramani Mahama, obtained 6,214,889. The evidence on record is that the chairperson of first respondent, having detected the error in announcing the figure of 13,434,574 as the total valid vote cast, corrected the error and issued a press release on the 10th of December 2020. The thrust of the issue under consideration is the error in the description of figures quoted by the chairperson of first respondent while declaring the results of the presidential election. In this petition, evidence has been adduced through PW1, Mr. C. Edun Ketia, to show that the actual total valid vote cast, excluding the votes from the Chim and South, at the time the declaration was made, was 13,121,111. This figure has been admitted by the petitioner in paragraph 12 of his petition, which reads as follows, quote, if the total number of valid votes standing to the names of each of the presidential candidates is summed up, 
This would yield a total number of valid votes cast of 30,121,111. A figure that is completely missing from the purported declaration by Mrs. Jane Aduku, Adukwe Mensa on 9 December 2020 and the purported rectification on 10 December 2020. End of quote. In law, a party is bound by his pleadings, and the only way he could free himself from the only way he could free himself from the amendment in his pleading is through amendment. See Hamon and Adoy, uh, Adoy. Mm -hmm. Hamon and Adoy, 1982-83, two Ghana report, page 1215. The above pleading was supported by the evidence of Peter Wamisa, while under co-examination on the 1st of February 2021 by counsel for the second respondent. The relevant part of the co-examination is reproduced below. Question. I, I am saying that from the declaration in the video clip that we just saw, which really is the basis of all your case, and you should know what is in it. The total number of valid votes that second respondent obtained is 6,780,413. Answer. That is correct, my loss. Question. The total number of votes that the petitioner obtained from the declaration announced, uh, from the declaration announcement, your exhibit A is 6,214,899. Answer. That is so, my loss. Question. And I am also putting it to you that if you do a sum of these valid votes, it goes on. By court, you asked this question about an hour, hour ago, more than once or twice, and it has been answered. So it, it goes on. Question Can you tell the court what is 6,780,430 as a percentage of 30,121,111? My loss, my answer, my loss is 51.294. 5-3 ad infinitum. So it can be around, it can be round up to 51.295%. Question. So 51.295%, 51.295%, not so. Answer. Yes. What about the petitioner? His total valid votes are 6,214,899. What is this sum as percentage of 13 million? 121,111. Answer. It is 47.365569 and infinitum. So it can be rounded up to 47.366%. Question. Do you admit, so do you, so you admit that from the chairperson of first respondent declaration on 9 December, second respondent crossed the Cross the more than 50% threshold answer from the declaration as announced. Question from the figures that we just calculated. These figures which were announced, if you if if you do them as percentage of the actual total valid votes, these are the percentages you get for the petitioner and the second respondent. That is what I'm putting it to you. By quote, Mr. Kutampa, when you recapture your when you recapture your question this is what raises a difficulty you are your previous or the second respondent crossed the 50 percent threshold in recapturing you are recapturing you change the second part so kindly stick to the question question i am putting uh, sorry i am saying that for the calculation of the figures of petitioner and second respondent second respondent click cross more than 50 percent threshold well if the fig answer well if the figures are correct yes question again you see that when you calculated the percentage for the second respondent you came to a figure of 51.295 percent answer yes my loss end of quote now from this pleadings and now from the pleadings of the petitioner of paragraph 12 thereof and the evidence elicited from Mr. C. Dungetia as shown above. There is no doubt that the petitioner accepts that the total valid vote cast was 30,121,111 and not the figure 
30,484,574, erroneously described by the chairperson of first respondent on the 9th December 2020. Having determined on the evidence adduced at the trial that the total valid votes cast was 13,121,111, there is no legal basis for anyone to contend that a different figure of 30,434,574 be used as the total valid votes cast in measuring the more than 50% threshold required under Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. Indeed, PW1, Mr. Isidun Ketia, had a cross examination on the same 1st February 2021. My counsel for second respondent admitted that it would be wrong for anyone to use the total votes cast to measure the threshold. PW1 testified under cross examination as follows. Question. Do you admit? So do you admit? Question. So you admit that it is completely wrong for anyone to use the total votes as, as a basis for determining the percentage of votes obtained by different candidates? Answer. Yes. Question. Anybody who does that, he cannot be accepted anywhere in Ghana. Answer. Yes, my lord. The cross-examination of Peter Wuhan continued on the same day as follows. Question. I am putting it to you that you use this erroneous figure as a basis for calling for your rerun. Answer. The question again. I want to get the answer again so I can answer. The answer. The question again. I want to get the question again so I can answer. Question. You cannot use that wrong figure as a basis for your claim that there should be a rerun between the second respondent and the petitioner. Answer, yes, my lord. Um, end of quote. But the above evidence, PW1, as you can tell, conceded that the figure representing total votes cast, that is 30,434,574, cannot be the basis for measuring the more than 50% threshold required for a candidate to be elected the president under clause 3 of Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution, which provides that. Quote, a person shall not be elected as president of Ghana unless at the presidential election the number of votes cast in his favor is more than 50% of the total number of valid votes cast at the election. End of quote. The above provision of the Constitution is clear that the threshold to be crossed by a candidate declared as president should be more than 50% of the total valid votes cast and not the total votes cast. From the evidence on record, it is clear to us that it is absolutely wrong to hold on to the error permitted by the chairperson of first respondent in announcing the total, val total vote cast when from the data using, used in announcing the results, the true figure representing the total valid vote cast actually total and was known to be 13,121,111. The evidence also is that this error was corrected. More so, there is no evidence on record showing that the error and subsequent correction had any adverse impact on the results so declared. As demonstrated, the candidate declared as winner still passed the more than 50% threshold as required by clause 3 of the Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution. It has also been argued on behalf of the petitioner that the chairperson of first respondent could not have on his own correct could not have on her own corrected the error she made without consulting the stakeholders of the 2020 presidential election. No statute or regulation was cited to us by a counsel for the petitioner for this submission and our collective industry has not revealed any. This submission does not find favor with the court in view of Article 297C of the 1992 Constitution provide that. 297. In this Constitution and in any other law, where a power is given to a person or authority to do or enforce the doing of an act or a, a thing, all such powers shall be deemed to be also given as are necessary to enable that person or authority to do or enforce the doing of the act or thing. End of quote. It is important to make reference to Section 22 of the Interpretation Act 2009, Act 792, which deals with omissions and errors in the course of executing administrative or executive functions. The section provides as follows. 
2021. Where an enactment confers a power or imposes a duty on a person to do an act or a thing of an administrative or executive character or to make an appointment, the power or duty may be exercised or performed in order to correct an error or omission in the previous exercise of the power or the performance of the duty. End of quote. We are therefore of the considered opinion that the chairperson of the first responder had the right to effect the correction she made when she erroneously referred to total votes instead of the total valid votes cast in the declaration. In conclusion, so in concluding this issue, we hold that there is evidence on record to show that based on the data contained in the declaration of the third person of the first respondent, the second respondent obtained more than 50% of the valid votes cast as required by Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. Issue 3, effect of the Chimasal constituency presidential election result. The next issue is whether or not the second respondent still met the Article 63 Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution threshold by the exclusion or inclusion of the Techim and South constituency presidential election result. This issue is partly addressed by the resolution of issue 2 above. The declaration by the chairperson of first respondent, which was tendered in evidence by Mr. Johnson as Exhibit A, clearly shows that the votes declared was without the votes from the Chiman South constituency. It does shows that from the evidence on record as already held, without the votes of the Chiman South constituency, the second respondent certified the threshold of more than 50% of the valid votes cast. The evidence on record adduced through the cross-examination of PW1, Mr. Sidwin has demonstrated above, confirmed that the second respondent obtained 51.295% of the total valid votes cast, excluding the vote from the Chima and South constituency. What was the result when the votes from the Chima and South constituency presidential election were added to the respective votes of the second respondent and the petitioner? It is important to state that at the time the petition was filed, the result of the Techiman, sorry, was filed, the result of the presidential election at Techiman South constituency had been announced. The result of the Techiman South constituency was part of SBTA, which was tendered by PW1, Mr. Sidun Ketia. The evidence on record clearly shows that even though PW1 complained about the tabulation of the total valid votes and the total votes cast, the votes obtained by the individual candidates were not challenged. The results were certified by agents of the petitioner and the second respondent. According to SBTE, out of the total voting population of 128,080, the total valid votes cast was 99,436 out of which the petitioner obtained 52,034, Increase, increasing his national total valid votes to 6,266,923. That is 6,214 plus 889, sorry, 6,214,889 plus 52,034. The second respondent also obtained 46,379, bringing his national total valid votes obtained to 6,776,792. That is 6,730,413 plus 46,379. It has been established without any dispute whatsoever that the national total valid votes cast without the votes from the Chiman South was 30,121,111. So adding the total valid votes from the Chiman South will give a national valid votes cast as 30,222,547. So 30,220,547. That's in, um, into bracket 30,121,111 plus 99,436,000. Mm. From the calculation above, the total valid votes obtained by the second respondent was 6,776,792.
which gives a percentage of the total national valid vote cast for the second respondent as 51.259%. The computation, therefore, shows clearly that with the inclusion of the Techi Mansar constituency presidential results, the second respondent nonetheless made the more than 50% threshold required under Clause 3 of the of Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution. It has been argued by the petitioner that going by the announcement of the chairperson of the first respondent, the second respondent would have would not have obtained the more than 50% threshold if all the votes of the team and South was allocated to the petitioner. This will mean crediting the petitioner with all the 128,018 votes being the total voter population of the Techi Mansa constituency on the assumption that every registered voter did vote and there were no rejected ballots. The petitioner would have obtained 6,342,907. That is 6,214,899 plus 128,018. And this would have, this would also have increased the national total valid votes to 13,249,129. That is into rackets 13,121,111 plus 128,018. With this scenario, the total valid votes obtained by second respondent will remain 6,730,413, meaning the second respondent obtained zero votes in Techi Massa constituency. The second respondent votes express a percentage of the total valid vote cast of 13,249,129 will still give second respondent 50.7989% of the valid vote cast, thus meeting the threshold required by Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. The above analysis, which is based on the scenario that the second respondent did not gain any valid votes in Techi by South constituency, is inaccurate and misleading, since the results from that constituency were known even before the petition was filed in this court. The end result is that the second respondent still met the threshold of more than 50% of the total valid votes cast, with the exclusion or inclusion of the Techi by South constituency presidential election results. Contrary to counsel for petitioners written address that paragraph 13 and 14 of the petition stands on challenge on record by virtue of order 23 rules 1 and 3 of the high court civil procedure rules CR 47. Since the first respondent failed to assign the notice to admit facts serve on it, the petitioner tendered as BB the press release of the first respondent dated 10 December 2020. The pleadings, HBB and the testimony of PW1 spoke to issues raised in this request to admit facts. We have already heard that the correction made by the chairperson of the first respondent in the press release was within a mandate by virtue of Article 297C of the 1992 Constitution and Section 22.1 of the Interpretation Act 2009 Act. 792. Secondly, PW1 Johnson and Sabin under cross examination admitted that the total valid votes obtained by all the 12 presidential candidates captured in SBT is 13,121,111. As a matter of law, regarding the application of Order 23 of CR 47, we must make it clear that with the coming into force of CR 99, no party in the presidential election dispute can allocate himself to apply the rules of other course without this course express adoption of those rules. There was no application to invoke Order 23 of CI 47 before this court. Issue 4. Whether the declaration of 9 December was in violation of Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. This issue seeks to ascertain whether on the 9th of December 2020, the first respondent, who was also the returning officer of the presidential elections, declared a candidate who contested the election as having been validly elected president when that candidate did not meet the required 50% threshold 
under Article 33 of the 1992 Constitution. The case put up by the petitioner that has generated this issue has been particularly set out in paragraphs 26, 27, 28, and 29 of the petition, which for purposes of emphasis are reproduced as follows. 26. The Gazette notice of the outcome of the presidential election is required to be based on the declaration actually made by Mrs. Jane and Queen Mensah, the chairperson of the first respondent and the returning officer of the result of the presidential election. 27. The Gazette notification contained in CI 135 be notification of the public declaration made by Jane and Queen Mensah on the evening of 9 December 2020 is also unconstitutional, null and void, and of no effect whatsoever, and therefore liable to be set aside. 28. On 10 December 2020, an unsigned press release of first respondent claimed that its chairperson, Jane, Mrs. Jane Adequay Mesa, had inadvertently used the figure of 13 million four hundred and thirty three thousand five hundred and five hundred and seventy three for the total value forecast. The cell release claimed that the total value forecast is not thirteen million one hundred and nine thousand four hundred and sixty. A copy of the press release is attached and marked as HBD and available on the first respondent website www.ec.gov.gh as at 11.45 hours GMT on the 5th, 29th December 2020. In this purported corrective press release, paragraph 29, in this correct, uh, in this purported corrective press release, first respondent introduced two completely new figures of the total vote in the presidential election. Thus, there w was no correction properly so-called since to be valid. A correction of a prior mistake must correctly name the mistake to be corrected. In this case, the mistake to be corrected was itself mistakenly stated. The numbers 13,435,574 and 13,433,557 are completely different with the margin of 1,001 votes. End of quote. Both the first and second respondents have made specific denials of these averments in their respective answers to the petition. The first respondent in denial of this allegation averred as follows. Quote, first respondent therefore says that the petitioner's simulation of the results which deliberately uses and relies on the total number of votes passed which was inadvertently mentioned as total number of valid votes at the press conference to arrive at the calculation, uh, the conclusion that the percentage of valid votes for second respondent will not meet the 60 percent, uh, will not meet the Article 63 constraint threshold is misleading, untenable, and misconceived. The second respondent denial, denial as particularly adverted to in paragraph 30 of this amended answer to the petition as, as, as follows. Quote, second respondent does not admit paragraphs 28 and 29 of the petition and says in further answer there too that in any event the margin of 1,001 votes contained in the alleged error cannot under any circumstances affect the outcome of the election even if added to petitioner's votes and the votes. It is these conflicting positions of the parties which have engendered the setting down of the above issue for the demolition by this court. As was accentuated by, the, by this court paving in Jersey, in the case of Sapon disease, subsequent by Code Rural Bessie, to 2020, one Supreme Court of Ghana law report 77. 736 at 747. The principle of law is that the burden of persuasion rests with the person who substantially asserts the affirmative of the issue on the pleadings. And this is a principle of law that has been unremittingly followed by our course for decades. By law, therefore, the burden of persuasion on this issue is cast squarely on the petitioner. Besides, there is a constitutional presumption of validity of the constitutional instrument in which a person is named as president of Ghana in the outcome of a presidential election. This has been provided for under Article 63, Clause 9 of the 1992 Constitution as follows. Quote, an instrument 
which is executed under the hand of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and under the seal of the Commission and B states that the person named in the instrument was declared elected as the president of Ghana at the election of the president shall be prima facie evidence that the person named was so elected. End of quote. The presumption above is reverberant of the statutory presumption that is provided for in section 37 of the Evidence Act 1975 NRC 323, which is reproduced below as follows. Quote 371. It is presumed that official duty has been regularly performed. End of quote. Especiating on the scope of the application of section 371 of the Evidence Act, Aikens JSC delivering the judgment of this court in the case of Bobe and others versus Kwaku 1995 96, 1 Ghana Law Report 125, observed us. Quote, this case, the common law presumption of communia presamunto rete exe atta, and the commentary on the evidence decree confirms at page 31 that it is generally applied to judicial and governmental acts, but may also be applied to duties required to be performed by law. End of quote. Accordingly, a presumption is thus a rule of law, statutory or judicial, which leads to a conclusion on a particular issue which leads to a decision on a particular issue in favor of the party who establishes it or relies upon it unless it is rebutted. In Harvey's Laws of England, fourth edition, issue volume 11, two, at paragraphs 1008 to 1009, page 83, which deals with rebuttable presumptions of law. The authors lucidly state the presumption thus, quote, a rebuttable presumption of law is one which leads to a decision on a particular issue in favor of a party who establishes it or relies upon it unless it is rebutted. Rebuttable presumptions of law may be created by statute or may exist at common law and may cast either a legal or evidential burden on a party seeking to rebut the presumption. End of quote. The presumption that is raised in Article 63, Clause 9 of the 1992 Constitution, undoubtedly, is a rebuttable one, as the 1992 Constitution makes room for the contestation of the instrument aforesaid. Being a rebuttable presumption, therefore, there is no gain saying that the onus of this rebuttal allows on the party against whom the presumption operates. The onus of rebuttal of this prima facie evidence that the second respondent will validly elected in accordance with the provisions of Article 63 plus 3 of 1992 Constitution does rest on the petitioner who has mounted the challenge against the said process. In the instant petition, two statutory presumptive situations exist. Section 37 of Evidence Act creates the presumption that the chairperson or the first respondent regularly performed her constitutional and statutory duties during the presidential election of 7 December 2020, leading to the declaration of the results made on 9 December 2020, unless otherwise rebutted by admissible, cogent, and credible evidence pointing to the contrary. Additionally, the effect of the instrument under the hand of the chairperson of the first respondent, that is, the declaration of the president-elect instrument 2020 CI 135, constitutes prima facie evidence that the second respondent was duly and validly elected pursuant to Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution 2020. Thus, the presumption created by the combined effects of the two provisions, which are constitutional and statutory, can only be dislodged or displaced by sufficient evidence in law. It is our considered opinion that the error in the declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent in the declaration of the result on the 9th December 2020, which error was acknowledged and corrected, and which in reality did not adversely affect the electoral fortunes of any of the candidates who contested the presidential election, including the petitioner hearing, is insufficient to rebut the presumption aforesaid. We have already determined in this judgment that in her declaration of 9th December 2020, the chairperson of the first respondent erroneously announced the figure of 13,434,574 as the total value was cast instead of 11, 13,121,111, which excluded the votes from Techima and South Constituency. 
and have demonstrated that the figures announced in the declaration, which is contained in Exhibit A, in reality, represented the true will of the voters, in that no credible evidence has been added to challenge any of the figures allotted to the respective candidates from the polling stations. The complaint of the petitioner relating to Exhibit A is about the error committed by the chairperson of the first respondent. The evidence on record was that this error was corrected by the very next day after the declaration on the 10th of December 2022, a press release. There is no dispute that the chairperson of the first respondent committed an error which he made when he made the declaration. We are, however, satisfied from the evidence on record that the figures announced was as representing the valid votes obtained by the respective candidates were right and represented the will of the voters. We therefore think that the error committed by the chairperson of the first opponent cannot void the declaration which actually announced the true wishes of the voters. To hold otherwise will mean that errors in statement and numbers committed by chairperson of the first opponent in an election which do not impact on the outcome of the result would nullify the actual results. Indeed, as discussed earlier in this judgment, there is ample evidence that the figures that were announced by the chairperson of the first respondent clearly gave the second respondent total valid votes of 6,730,413, which represents 51.295% of the total valid votes of 13,121,111. This satisfies the more than 50% threshold of valid votes as required under Clause 3 of Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution. The declaration by the first respondent, therefore, did not validate Clause 3 of Article 63 of the 1992 Constitution. The trust of petitioners' case is that by the collated figures, none of the candidates obtained more than 50% threshold required under Article 63 plus 3 of the 1992 Constitution. And as such, the first respondent should be ordered by this court to conduct fresh elections between the second respondent and the petitioner. However, the petitioner has failed to adduce any credible evidence to establish his claim that none of the candidates obtained more than the 50% threshold. PW1, Mr. Isidun Ketia, testified under cross-examination that even though the petitioner had all the documents that the first responder used to collate the results from the polling stations to the regional collation centre, the petitioner decided not to tender them in evidence support to support the petition. Under cross-examination by counsel for second respondent on the 1st of February 2021, this is what PW1 said among others, quote, question, as you know, all the documents that the EC was using to collect the results from the polling stations right up to the regional center, you had carbon copies of them, didn't you? Answer, yes, we do. Question, and I'm saying that you have not put together your carbon copy to show that indeed nobody won the elections. Answer. Yes, my laws, because that is not the purpose of a petition. We did not come to court to take over the work of the Electoral Commission. But we are entitled, if we see the results are flawed, they are not born out of data. We are entitled to challenge and insist that we must have credible results and a declaration that is on the votes that were cast at the polling stations. Question. I am saying that you have not provided any basis for your own, of your own, for your call for a runoff. Answer, no, my laws, we have not brought that data here. We did not consider it necessary to bring any such data here. End of quote. The evidence is thus clear that the petitioner failed to lead credible evidence to prove his case that none of the parties who contested the presidential election with him made the more than 50% threshold as required by Clause 3 of Article 63 of 1992 Constitution. And so there should be a rerun. All the petitioner, all the petitioner sought to do by way of evidence was to tender Exhibit A to demonstrate that the chairperson of first respondent committed errors in making the declaration 
But as already stated, that error could not take away the valid votes of the people. Having held that the declaration by the chairperson of first respondent on 9th of December 2020 did not validate Article 63, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution, we will end the resolution of Issue 4 with two admonitions. The first is that for his team brother, Mavmoni JC, in the case of Akufuadu Hernandez versus Mahama in another Supra, at page 439. Quote, elections are complex systems designed and run by fallible human beings. Thus, it is not surprising that mistakes, errors, or some other imperfection occur during an election. Because absolute electoral imperfection is unlikely and because finality and stability are important values. Not every error, imperfection, or combination of problems found in an election contest voids the election or changes its outcome. End of quote. The second is to express a disagreement this, this disagreement with this issue in these positions that the petitioner literally hangs on how he lives on. The petitioner attacked the oral declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent in relief A, B, and C, and consequently sought an annulment of CI 135 in relief D. He also invited the court to jump the second respondent for moving himself out as the president elect on the, the account of the errors described in the declaration in his release for the court to and for the court to order a rerun between the petitioner and second respondent on account of the alleged effect of these errors in relief F. But as shown from the evaluations and analysis above, it was part of the petitioner's case in paragraph 6 of the petition that the first alleged error arose because of a misdescription of the number of total votes cast as total valid votes cast. The petitioner also asserted his knowledge of the total valid votes cast in paragraph 12 of his petition. And yet the petitioner is inviting the court to ignore the substantive truth of the result of the election and give him relief on the basis of the errors pointed out in his own petition. He is also inviting the court to use the mistakes he has described to tamper with the true and known result of the presidential election and the will of the people. By his relief A, it, it is only when the court opposed the error in the description of total votes cast instead of total valid votes that the declaration would be in breach of Article 3 Clause 3. Again, by relief F, a B, it is when the court ignores the substantive relief of the election, re results of the election, that it could it declare that no candidate won more than 50% of the votes. The petitioner is making his claim, knowing that if the court agrees, the court will essentially change the true outcome of the election. In the, Combined effects of relief C and F, the petitioner is asking this court to find the oral declaration made on 9 December 2020 to be unconstitutional, null and void, and yet for this court to use void declaration to change the result of the election by ordering a rerun between the two leading candidates. These are submissions that must not appeal to any court of justice, equity, and good conscience. Issue 5. The alleged vote pardon. The last issue set down for this trial is whether or not the alleged vote pardon and other errors complained of by the petitioner affected the outcome of the presidential election results of 2020. The petitioner has alleged in his petition that first respondent favored the second respondent with padded votes totaling 5,662 in 32 constituencies. In proof of this allegation, the petitioner tendered to PW1. Mr. Edwin Ketia is with F, which is a spreadsheet covering samples, sample details from 26 constituencies, showing the alleged vote pardon by certain officials of the first respondent in favor of the second respondent. It is pertinent to note that even though the pleadings of the petitioner alleges that the vote pardon 
took place in 32 constituencies, totaling 5,662 votes. PW1, in his witness statement, testified that the vote party rather took place in 26 constituencies and total 4,693 votes. We know that even though PW1 alleged in his witness statement that the vote party was done by some officials of the first respondent, his evidence did not name any alleged official. That leg of the allegation was not proof either. The allegation of vote fraud in favor of second respondent was denied by both respondents. Having been so denied, one expected the petitioner to adduce credible evidence to prove him. However, the only evidence adduced on this issue was the tendering of SBDF, the spreadsheet containing samples from 26 constituencies, showing the alleged vote pattern. To be specific, the allegation as stated at paragraph 36 of Mr. Sabin Tedier's witness statement was that when the vote of second respondent obtained in all polling stations, as shown on their respective pinches, in the 26 constituencies aggregated, the resultant figure differs from the figure that was declared by first respondent for second respondent as captured on the summary sheets of the respective 10 constituencies. Having alleged as above, one expected that the pinches of the 26 uh, stations in the 20 pinches of the polling stations in the 26 constituencies would have been exhibited to prove the vote pardon as alleged. This was not done apart from the spreadsheet which was self-serving document. PW1, Mr. C. Edinkati admitted that what he had tended were only samples, but no effort was made to submit the rest if indeed they existed. Besides the allegation of vote pardon, the petitioner also alleged that there, were, there was wrong aggregation of votes, total 916 votes in favor of second respondent. This was contained in SBT, tendered by PW1, Mr. C. Dunketia. We find the allegation of vote pardon very serious, since its occurrence undermines the integrity of an election. Its impact being that votes are unlawfully added to the votes of a candidate to increase the total votes of that candidate. We have observed already that this allegation was not proof as expected of the petitioner. However, assuming the votes pardon of four, the, assuming the votes pardon of 4,693 took place at all in favor of second respondents as alleged by PW1 in Exhibit F, this court would then have to ascertain its impact on the final results declared by the first respondent. Indeed, evidence on record clearly showed that the impact of the alleged vote pardon, even if proved, would have been very insignificant and would not have materially affected the outcome of the elections. It would therefore not have been a proper ground for the annulment of the 2020 presidential elections. This is so because if one deducts the alleged votes parted from the total valid votes obtained by the second respondent, he would still have crossed the more than 50% threshold required under Article 63 cross 3 of the 1992 Constitution. This fact was established through the co examination of PW1, Mr. Esiedun Ketia, on 1st February 2021 by counsel for the second respondent as follows. Question. The original figure is 6,730,143. Subtract from the 4,693. What do you get? Answer. You get 6,725,720. Question. What is that figure as a percentage of 13,121,111? Answer, 51.295%. So you see that even if you were to deduct your alleged party votes from the votes of the second respondent, he still crosses the 50% plus threshold. Answer, I disagree because samples cannot be subtracted from another population figure. We observe that PW1 from the above extract was merely being evasive. Since it is obvious 
that if we take away the alleged padded votes of 4,683 from the total valid votes of the second respondent as of 2nd December, 2, December 2020, as shown above, the second respondent will still have obtained more than 50% of the total valid vote cast, satisfying the threshold of Article 63 Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution. On this issue, we are settled in our minds that the negation of vote pardon, though serious in an election such as the presidential election, was not proved by credible evidence. Furthermore, even if the vote pardon took place, same was not material or substantial to change the final results so declared by the chairperson of the first respondent. In holding that the impact of the vote pardon, if even proof, could not have affected the declaration. We are emboldened by the decision of Lord Denny in the case of Morgan versus Simpson, 1975, 1 Queen's Bench, 151, which was cited by counsel for the petitioner in his closing address. We are observed, however, that counsel for petitioner only referred us to only one of the three propositions articulated by Lord Denny. In that case, Lord Denny summarized the duty of courts in making declarations upon hearing election petitions, he stated three propositions as follows. One, if the election was conducted so badly that it was not substantially in accordance with the law as to elections, the election is vitiated, irrespective of whether the result was affected or not. Two, if the election was so conducted that it was substantially in accordance with the law, as to elections, it is not vitiated by a breach of the rules or a mistake at the polls, provided that it did not affect the result of the election. Three, but even though the election was conducted substantially in accordance with the law, as to elections, nevertheless, if there was a breach of the rules or a mistake at the polls, and it did affect the results, then the election is vitiated. When Lord Denny's propositions are read as a whole, the combined effect of the proposition is that an election will be voided upon the occurrence of infractions that actually affect the votes of the citizens cast at the police stations and not the incidents of administrative errors and or mistakes committed by officers charged with the conduct of such elections. We find this same sentiment expressed by our own eminent jurist at the GSC in the first presidential election petition case, Ekufuadu and Addis versus Mahama and Addis, number 4, 2013, Supreme Court of Ghana Law Report, special edition, page 73 at page 237 to 237 to 238. Her ladyship had this to say. Quote, courts surely apply the election code to protect, not to defeat the right to vote. Public policy favors salvaging the election and giving effect to the voters intent if possible. The right to vote is at the core of a democratic dispensation. A principle I've affirmed in this opinion with reference to the Tenadi and Angla Okansi line of this. End of quote. Conclusion. We conclude this judgment by emphasizing that the petitioner did not demonstrate in any way how the alleged errors in unilateral collisions made by the first respondent affected the validity of the declaration made by the chairperson of the first respondent on the 9th December 2020, as already stated in the judgment. The petitioner has not produced any evidence to rebut the presumption created by the publication of CI-135 for which his action must fail. We have therefore no reason to order a rerun as prayed by the petitioner as in relief F. We are only dismissed the petition as having no merit. As the court pleases. Mm. 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 Court. The petition is dismissed as without merit. We make no order as to cause. We are grateful to the court.
Mr. Lazo, I'm most grateful for the lucid judgment of the court. Well, Lord, with respect, we seeking to ask take the opportunity to thank the Registrar of the Court and also the staff for their support in getting the proceedings and meeting at that weekend's far processes. We thank them too. I, I just have one comment. I'm surprised that uh, for the various teams, um, your frontline staff uh, did not include any woman. Um, both the petitioner, the first respondent, the second respondent, your frontline legal representation did not include any woman. But there are ladies at the bar, and every effort should be encouraged. No, frontline, the four. And then frontline. order in court, please. Order. Is there any reason somebody like Sheila Minka Premo and former Attorney General uh, should be able to um, explain why um, this thing should be encouraged in this day and age? My Lord, if I may, oh, okay. if your lordships will recall, Frontline, frontline, you are four. If your losses will recall, on the first day, we proceeded to announce lawyers for the second respondent. And indeed, we did announce Sheila Minka Puma. When the court said no, we couldn't have more than four. <laughs> because of that, the COVID protocol. <laughs> Rise.